Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon and a warm welcome to everybody from the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, uh, the OIIP, uh, here in Vienna. Um, today, uh, we want to talk about uh, how the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine impacts the relationship between Moscow and Beijing, um, a crucial relationship for the future of the international order uh, and also crucial for Russia's ability to sustain the war effort uh, in 2023. Uh, we have the enormous privilege uh, of talking uh, to Professor Maria Repnikova, uh, Dr. Carla Freeman, uh, and Dr. Martin Kasmarski, uh, who I want to thank very much uh, for choosing to spend their time with us today. Uh, they are three tremendous scholars on the subject, uh, whose work I cannot recommend enough. Uh, Professor Repnikova works at Georgia State University and is a Wilson China Fellow. Uh, among many other things, uh, she has worked on how China and Russia align on strategic communication and published on Chinese propaganda uh, on the war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, her book on Chinese soft power uh, was published by Cambridge University Press last year. Uh, Dr. Kasmarski works at Glasgow University, uh, a veteran scholar of Russia-China relations. Uh, he has, among other things, uh, published on the importance uh, of respective domestic politics, on the future of the relationship after the war, uh, including in the economic sphere uh, and on the West's policy options. Uh, Dr. Freeman uh, previously directed the Johns Hopkins Science Foreign Policy Institute uh, and is now uh, a senior expert on China at the US Institute of Peace. Uh, she has, among many other things, uh, worked on potential points of rivalry and friction in the relationship uh, and has published on how China's vision of global security uh, relates uh, to Russia and its war. My name is Thomas Eda. I'm a postdoc researcher here at the OIIP and I work on China. Now I will start uh, with a number of uh, questions right away. Um, we have 60 minutes. Uh, audience members uh, can also post questions uh, in the Zoom chat function uh, and I will aim to get to those as well. Uh, our debate uh, is being recorded and you can watch it on our website uh, or on YouTube uh, later on. All right, uh, now um, please excuse me uh, for asking for uh, a very short uh, answer uh, on this first question uh, to all three of you. Uh, it's to give us a broad idea uh, and then we're going to dig down. Uh, did relations uh, between China and Russia uh, become stronger, weaker, or did they stay the same uh, since Russia's full invasion uh, of Ukraine last February? Uh, Professor Repnikova? Well, I would argue that in the economic and security realm, the relations have become stronger as we see more uh, exchanges on the economic front in terms of trade, but also security, military exchanges. But when it comes to the symmetry of this relationship, I think the relationship is increasingly um, asymmetrical. It already has been asymmetrical before the war, but during this uh, war and uh, the ongoing conflict, we see that China is emerging as a much stronger player in this relationship. And this is apparent through speeches we observed between and meetings between Vladimir Putin and President Xi as well as the media coverage and reportage where we see Russian media kind of playing into this relationship a lot more than Chinese media. So Russian media often highlighting that China is a friend uh, and continuing a supporter of Russia, whereas on the Chinese front, we see much more ambivalent statements and we can talk about the information domain later on. But uh, I would see this relationship as at the very least staying the same, if not going stronger uh, in several domains, but at the same time increasingly asymmetrical. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Freeman? Yeah, I think uh, Maria put it very well. I, I really agree with her. It is uh, the relationship has been uh, actually strengthening along many lines. Uh, economic is uh, very apparent uh, as China is an, a more and more important uh, consumer of, of Russian energy and uh, also a more and more important source of, of goods uh, and probably services to, to Russia. Of course, carefully uh, making sure that it doesn't violate sanctions in its uh, deepening uh, economic relationship with Russia. And its military ties, and we can talk a little bit more about this later, have uh, been sustained, uh, including uh, joint exercises and, uh, and uh, other, other facets of the military relationship. Uh, so, and fundamentally, the two uh, sides have been uh, only drawn closer together as, uh, as the U.S. Uh, works with its allies and partners to strengthen uh, security relations from Europe uh, through the Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific, uh, around China's perimeter uh, periphery, and uh, that has, uh, has just uh, cemented sort of the ideological and uh, and geopolitical perspectives of the two countries. But as, as Maria pointed out, 
uh, it's also clear that the balance and the relationship has shifted. China's clearly more skeptical of, of Russia's military capabilities uh, given its performance in the war uh, and uh, also uh, has, uh, has set some limits uh, telling Putin very clearly, as uh, Maria alluded to in Samarkand, uh, you're not gonna mess with Kazakhstan. Uh, there are limits, uh, even though uh, you may have irredentist aspirations, we, we have, uh, we're not going to uh, let you, uh, let you uh, pursue those. So uh, a, a, a deeper relationship, but one that is shifting in, its, uh, in, its, uh, in the power dynamics between the two sides. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kazmarski? Uh, thank you. I agree with both my predecessors that the relationship has improved and has strengthened the ties between Moscow and Beijing have strengthened. But I also see a clear limitation. There, there is the upper limit. So the, what, what both mentioned, the China's unwillingness to uh, risk any major strategic support, support for Russia demonstrates that it's far from being an alliance. Thank you very much. Um, I have uh, recently read um, an article uh, by Sheena Chestnut Greitens in, in, in Asian Survey, and I think uh, this can help us to, to dig down and see uh, how and, and, and where uh, the relationship uh, deepened or, or, or not. Um, she argues that since the full-scale invasion, uh, Beijing has supported uh, Moscow in the informational and diplomatic domain, uh, has remained self-interested in the economic domain, and hasn't shifted from previous policies in the military domain. Now, um, first of all, you can tell me that you disagree with that, um, but I will proceed from this uh, framework uh, and ask you questions uh, about these uh, different domains. Uh, Professor Repnikova, uh, how did the Sino-Russian uh, cooperation in the informational uh, domain, so on propaganda and, and disinformation, uh, develop during the war? Uh, if you could address both uh, official statements and, and the media, uh, what, what are we talking about here? And, and, and were there any shifts uh, since February 24th? Um, sure. Well, first of all, I think in terms of the argument that um, Sheena Greitens is making, uh, the informational and the diplomatic in her argument are kind of merged together when it comes to support for Russia. I would argue there is a distinction between the diplomatic statements made by top officials, high level officials and the media coverage. So in my analysis, I found that the media has been uh, much more tacitly supportive of, of the war, whereas the diplomatic statements have been a lot more um, in the middle, right? They're kind of trying to strike a middle ground of uh, promoting peace solutions and kind of not not really uh, adhering to the same narrative as, as the media. So I think that there is a distinction there between diplomatic and media um, media coverage or uh, expressions about the war. So that's just the first point I wanted to make. And then when it comes to the informational domain in the media space, uh, what I found is that over the course of this war, and of course it's an ongoing war, so we're still observing and collecting data in some projects I'm working on, but there are several ways in which uh, Chinese state media, that's, that's what we're looking at, has been supportive uh, of Russia. And the support is not uh, always direct. I would argue it's much more indirect, kind of implicit, and it's implicit in several ways. One is how they frame responsibility for the war. From the beginning up until now, the West is framed as the key responsible actor West, NATO, and the U.S. in particular, up to this day, there's, there are arguments being made that the U.S. is benefiting from this war. At the beginning, the argument was that the U.S. instigated the war. So the argument gets a little bit twisted, but there's still this framing of responsibility on the West. Um, and then there's a deflection of Russia's responsibility in general. So we see, for instance, major war crimes um, an escalation of this war being reported in much softer tones. Oftentimes, Russia is not even mentioned uh, for a very long time in the article. So we see titles that, you know, for example, Kiev is being bombed. So it's a passive kind of uh, argument, but we don't see who is bombing Kiev. So it's, a, it's an interesting kind of uh, use of language there. So they're using this indirect kind of vague language, and Russia is often omitted from uh, the discussion. Uh, and there's sometimes seeding of questioning to what extent some of the accusations from the West are true. So there's kind of a shadows of disinformation where they would ask whether or not Bucha massacre, for instance, uh, needs to be further investigated. So there's kind of seeding of some distrust for uh, the existing sources. And on a few occasions, but in particular, the one about the biolabs, uh, the story about the biolabs, American biolabs in Ukraine, that's where Chinese state media, but also officials, diplomats on Twitter have really went for it. And, you know, they kind of spread this um, rumor, this information uh, about the biolabs. But that was the one case where I think it was very explicit. The, the other cases are more Wait, subtle. Sorry just, sorry, just to intervene for a moment, maybe we should yeah. uh, tell uh, our audience, this was about uh, the allegation that the US was developing Developing biological oh, yeah. weapons uh, in, mm -hmm. in Ukraine that could be used yeah. uh, against Russia. 
So this was the case where the US government reacted very strongly. They accused China of siding with Russia. So it was a really kind of a, a major case, but at the same time, that's not really how most of China's communication about the war has been. For the most part, uh, it's kind of this uh, soft support. And uh, what I found interesting also is the over-reliance of Russian sources. So a lot of Chinese state media, they're really relying on the drawing on Russian official statements, um, reports, official you know, speeches and so forth. So it makes it kind of um, appear as if it's channeling some of these statements, again, kind of softly, but nonetheless, they're relying more on those than statements coming from Western media or from Ukraine. And just last point, there's a subtle difference also in uh, state media that's global, like CGTN versus domestic oriented media. So the global media has been a little bit more balanced and we've seen more reporting from Ukraine and about Ukraine, whereas the domestically oriented media is much more uh, careful about uh, basically underreporting what's happening uh, in Ukraine and, and with Ukrainian people, but more so kind of focusing on the Russian side of the story. So those are just a few things that uh, I've observed. And as far as changes over time, I found that actually there's quite a bit of continuity in these themes over time. So maybe it's surprising or not surprising. I see that still there's an increasing or ongoing reliance on Russian sources. There's still deflection of responsibility, um, and but there's a bit of softening when it comes to you know maybe calling for peace or echoing some diplomatic statements. That's you know sort of calling for this war to end. So there's a little bit of that kind of hopefulness, uh, but some of the other themes I've discussed are are still the same. Hmm. Thank you for these observations. I think this is uh, very important, um, uh, Dr. Freeman. Um, uh, now, uh, Professor Repnikova just said this, the, this difference between uh, media, Chinese media, and, and Chinese diplomats. Um, could you uh, tell us something about uh, how would you characterize 2022 trends uh, in Moscow, uh, Beijing, diplomatic ties? How should we weigh China's actions? Because uh, China sometimes abstains, sometimes supports Russia on UN votes. It recommits uh, to deepen ties uh, at bilateral meetings. Uh, but it also doesn't recognize Russia's uh, attempted annexations, uh, and in general terms, at least, uh, it speaks out against the potential use of nuclear weapons. Yeah, thank you for your question, Thomas. Um, just to go back to Sheena Greitens' uh, formulation that you described, I mean, I think I, I agree with it. I would just uh, probably put it more simply in, in a way you did that just now in your question. Uh, China's maintained a position that seeks to up uphold its uh, partnership with Russia, but it's also distance, it's distancing itself from the war in its diplomatic statements very clearly. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it all began, of course, we have to go back to February 4th, almost a year ago now, when, when Putin was in Beijing and, and, uh, and Putin and she stood up and, and um, made an announcement that they had a no limits uh, partnership that would have no, no forbidden areas of cooperation. Uh, after Russia's invasion, uh, less than three weeks later, then China was was in a position where it had to make clear that though there are no forbidden areas of cooperation, it doesn't does not support Russia's aggression against Ukraine and violation of sovereign of Ukrainian sovereignty. Uh, but uh, it, it understands understands and uh, and is willing to help. Russia justify uh, uh, its invasion. And in balance, its actions have been consistent, as we described earlier, with its partnership with Russia, even as it has protect protected its own interests you know, by not violating sanctions and so on. Uh, uh, but to clarify a bit further, uh, Beijing has been uh, dissatisfied with the outcomes. It's basically the outcomes of Putin's actions and aggressions against Ukraine. Uh, it has expressed concerns about the humanitarian costs, the economic costs in various uh, multilateral forums. Its uh, top lip diplomats have used words like deplore to criticize the conflict. Uh, and, uh, and we already mentioned uh, the, the Xi Jinping's uh, expression of concerns to Putin at the Shanghai Cooperation on the sidelines of the Shanghai Cooperation Forum uh, in September. Uh, the concerns that Putin strikingly acknowledged and uh, and actually that were, uh, I think that was included in the Russian readout of the meeting. Um, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's a complicated picture. Uh, now we're seeing some shift uh, and maybe, um, maybe uh, we can learn more about what this signifies. There've been some reports of officials in China publicly expressing views that are critical of, of Putin and Russia. Uh, we really haven't seen that much since uh, last March, when uh, when one scholar uh, with uh, a official uh, an official position, Hu Wei, uh, uh, criticized uh, and uh, the war and cautioned against uh, Beijing's support for for Russia in this in this war. But all in all, you know, it, it, China's support has been pretty consistent. As you mentioned, uh, Beijing has abstained or voted on resolutions in the UN Security Council and the General Assembly. Um, 
using its its voting power to uh, blunt uh, UN actions against Moscow. And this has extended to other forums. I mean, at the G20 summit late last year, uh, China joined Russia in trying to remove the word war from the Bali leaders declaration. So uh, we, we've seen those this, this steady, uh, steady support um, uh, for Russia, even in, in, in international fora. Um, so I think these details and, and others I could uh, talk about um, are some of the evidence that China's position on Russia and its invasion of Ukraine isn't so much a straddle, which is one of the words that we hear in the United States. That implies a kind of equivocal position, but it's, it's conditional uh, support. Because um, fundamentally, China still sees reasons to support Russia, economic reasons, uh, also, most importantly, strategic, geostrategic uh, reasons. And the two uh, leaders share a worldview uh, that uh, US hegemony is unfair and constraining, and in fact, dest destabilizing in its reliance on middle military uh, alliances. Um, and we could get into the Xi-Putin bromance uh, too, uh, the bond that the two leaders uh, share from their, the shock of the collapse of the Soviet Union and, and the, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and their shared irredentism uh, and sense of history, historical importance. Uh, so uh, in short, uh, the, uh, uh, China has been a, a supporter of Russia on the international stage, uh, even as it has tried to prescribe its support by, uh, by also uh, reaching out to Ukraine, in fact, and, uh, and uh, and insisting that it uh, does not support violations of international sovereignty. Uh, just a very quick follow-up. So these um, some some uh, critical notions uh, as as background noise from Chinese officials that that one might hear now uh, regarding uh, Putin. Uh, you do not see this already as a as a shift uh, to lessen uh, diplomatic support on on the international stage. I do not see it as, uh, as, as indicating a significant shift. I see it as part of uh, a, an opening of uh, debate, a uh, brief opening in debate in China as it makes a number of transitions. Uh, and it, it may have other significance as well uh, because it, it suggests it may be uh, permitted at, because it's, it, it is diplomatically useful perhaps to have those perspectives as China uh, begins this uh, diplomatic campaign uh, to the rest of the world as it opens up uh, and tries to restore relations, uh, particularly with Europe, but also to improve, even improve ties with the United States. Thank you very much. I think that's that's important as context, yes. Um, uh, Dr. Kasmarski, um, what, can you, what can you tell us um, about uh, trends in the economic relationship? Uh, between Moscow and Beijing, uh, what is more uh, important? Because uh, I think in the beginning, uh, uh, all of you uh, seem to frame it uh, rather rather clearly as 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 a positive, as as a as a growing uh, economic uh, relationship. But but I think uh, it, at least it seems to me as as, as a bit more uh, of a complicated picture. And I want to ask you, what is more important, uh, the growing trade, indeed, uh, or uh, some Chinese companies? Um, well, most Chinese companies appearing to respect sanctions, and and some uh, appearing. To, to withdraw uh, some banks, uh, cancelling some letters of credit, uh, all to steer clear uh, of, of secondary sanctions. Uh, thank you. Thank you for this question. It, very briefly, I would say that the Chinese, Chinese companies have decided to seize on opportunities that have emerged as a result of the conflict. The Chinese state, in my view, has not held out a helping hand by providing that would be a provision of a genuinely strategic economic support. So when we, when we speak um, about uh, the presence of Chinese companies in the market, they, in the Russian market, they use the opportunity of Western companies leaving. When we speak about electronics, when we speak about cars, we see that individual Chinese companies just seize the opportunity and increase their share in, in, the, in the Russian market. When we, uh, they, they often quoted, um, information is about the increasing supply of, of oil. But we need to remember that these are not only contracts of uh, um, large uh, state-owned um, companies in China, but also independent refineries. So they benefit from the discounts that Russia needs to offer in order to get, um, to get its oil um, yeah, sold and delivered. So in this sense, I would, uh, I would say that for me, this is the 
biggest limitation of this relationship that China, even though it is in a technological and economic rivalry with the US, which, which is de deepening despite these attempts to, to, to slow, slow it down, China has not decided to risk an even further conflict with the West. It has not decided to openly challenge the sanctions. It has not decided to support Russia, for instance, by announcing a new pipeline deal, by stepping in to offer uh, the Rosneft shares, which, which BP tries to disinvest from. It, it Theoretically, it opens the possibility for China to capitalize on a weaker Russia. It opens the possibilities to increase China's position in the, uh, especially in the energy market in, in Russia, but we haven't seen such, such moves. While individual companies uh, do what they can, either by stepping in or as, as you suggested, by making sure that they are not targeted with secondary, with secondary sanctions. Sorry, just a just a very quick follow up. Um, could you could you uh, perhaps give us uh, give us a bit of a, uh, an insight into uh, into um, the numbers, the volume of uh, of investment uh, coming in? Um, is, is there a big change? Is there is there a jump uh, in the Chinese uh, uh, investment numbers into in, into Russia? Um, and how does it this compare is, to 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 Western investment? This is something which is really difficult to untangle because a, I think it was a couple of uh, months ago that we saw the news about the complete lack of Chinese investments in Russia within the BRI, within the Belt and Initiative. But at the same time, given a, how flexible and how vague is the formula of BRI investment, I'm I cannot tell if this is really the case, and we haven't seen the, the investments. For sure, we haven't seen any major strategic investments. So we, we haven't seen the Chinese companies offering either uh, big loans, either propping up such projects which are now delayed, like, like Novatec's <clears throat> uh, Arctic to LNG project. And we have to remember that it was not actually the case after the annexation of Crimea, because at that time, China firstly agreed to the power of Siberia uh, pipeline deal. And secondly, it provided huge um, loans for uh, Novatec, which allowed the project to be implemented in time. So this is once again, something which is different from China's economic policy almost a decade ago. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's also interesting historical context. Um, now, um... For all three of you again, uh, and please forgive me for, for for again asking for for a very short answer. Um, <clears throat> does any does any scholar in in, in China or Russia uh, come to mind uh, who you would consider a, a bellwether uh, for this relationship in 2023? Uh, there is of course a spectrum of opinions um, despite censorship, uh, and people are more or less uh, influential or close to to decision makers. Um, whose publications and interviews uh, should we pay uh, attention to? Um, Professor Repnikova? Um, so from my, from my perspective, but the one I've been following a lot in Russia is Alexander Gabuyev, and I think a lot of people already do follow him, but I like his analysis, especially of the economic relations between China and Russia, but also military and security ties. And he unpacks a lot of the kind of mainstream articles that are written about this topic in a very detailed way, drawing on a lot of facts and uh, statistics coming from both sides. So I really enjoy his very detailed analysis. I also like uh, the work of his other two colleagues, uh, Igor Denisov and Ivan Zuinka. They're both at Carnegie and they write on different facets of China-Russia relationship. And Zuinka in particular writes also about border relations and the Far East, which I really find fascinating because it's something that's very important but doesn't get as much attention. So I, I enjoy his, his research a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Freeman. Well, I have, of course, I have to suggest my two fellow panelists <laughs> follow their work and you'll grow in wisdom. And uh, and so I, I do think they're both producing really important work. There are a number of Americans that I certainly read. Um, I go back to Gilbert Rosman, who's been around for a long time and and has a, a the a good, amazing linguistic ability. So can read uh, other all the regional languages and his work is always very insightful. He's a sociologist. Uh, 
Elizabeth Wishnick, uh, also excellent uh, China-Russia specialist. And there's a young scholar who I've not met yet, but I've been, uh, he's, he's made quite a splash in Washington from his post at American University, Joseph Terigian, who's, uh, mm. I spelled that, if I've pronounced that right, he's, these are all really good scholars and policy analysts. And there are many others uh, who've been around for a while whose work now is getting um, new attention like Gaia Christofferson and others. On the Chinese side, there are many scholars to follow. And um, I tend to go to Fudan University because there's a China-Russia dialogue, also Russia Central Asia Center. Uh, Professor Zhao Huasheng is one who comes to mind. But it was the IR theorist, uh, Tang Shiping, who, um, who gets credit uh, for having been the only Chinese scholar who actually predicted uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict, and I think that was some years ago. But uh, his work is uh, is looks at uh, the relationship, the uh, looks at Russia through a theoretical lens, but uh, obviously had some predictive value. So those are some of the scholars that I pay attention to. That's great, thank you, um, Dr. Kasmaski. To this, to this already long list, I would add the name of Vasily Kashin uh, in the Russian for uh, for his Institute. Who covers the military aspects of uh, of uh, Sino-Russian relations, and I think he's one of the best persons to follow uh, with with particular view on on this topic. Thank you very much. Now um, I'd like to go go back to you in, individually now, um, uh, Professor Etnikova. Um, do you see uh, a change uh, in Chinese uh, public opinion uh, on the state? and value uh, of the China-Russia relationship uh, over the course of the year uh, since, since February 24, uh, and also uh, have opinions on the war uh, changed and on whether, how, whether and how uh, Beijing should support uh, Moscow. Yeah, it's a bit of a difficult question because we know so little about Chinese public opinion uh, in general these days, but also about the war. And the only public opinion survey that's been, I think, making some headway, so at least getting some attention has been from the Carter Center that was just a couple of months ago, I believe, that they found some interesting insights or findings that indicated that on the one hand, there's um, a support for, you know, for uh, a support for China's kind of continuing, uh, continuing moral support for Russia, but they didn't want uh, China to support Russia militarily or economically. So there was an interesting kind of uh, division there between moral support, which is very symbolic, which is exactly what we talked about in informational space and diplomatic space, but not so much militarily or economically, which is something we also discussed just now in terms of uh, abiding by sanctions and uh, not provoking or uh, furthering this conflict uh, directly. So there was an interesting kind of co uh, continuity between the official, you know, kind of response and public opinion. Um, but at the same time, it's very difficult to gauge the public sentiment sentiments directly because so much of it has been censored at the beginning of the war. There have been some really interesting um, movements on social media that were pro-Ukraine and there were statements made by some scholars as well, some, some uh, petitions and, and also just public in general were kind of posting uh, some signs in support of uh, Ukraine. But then all of that has been kind of wiped out of the, of the internet. In addition to that, China is facing so many domestic crises, uh, including this ongoing fragile, you know, first zero COVID and a complete drastic reopening. So there's so much focus on domestic issues that I think Ukraine hasn't captured as much attention uh, on Chinese kind of social media, at least in recent months. Um, and it kind of reignites the, the issue reignites when there are major kind of escalations in, in the conflict. But then when it's, you know, on, on routine basis, there isn't as much discussion, which makes it even harder to gauge what the public is really thinking. But I think it's important just to highlight again that the public opinion is very much um, censored on this issue. And I think it's a very sensitive issue to discuss openly. So we don't quite hear um, too many alternative opinions. Um, and at the beginning also, there was a lot of nationalistic opinions that were kind of in support directly of um, this framing of, of West being the West being the guilty or the instigator, or, and even some talk about retaking Taiwan. But interestingly, those opinions have also been censored. So the, the very extreme nationalistic views and also the, the pro-Ukraine views have been kind of um, altered. So in that sense, we're kind of seeing some middle ground opinions coming up, but not as much of this kind of extremes, which I found interesting to observe over time. Thank you very much. Um, do you um, uh, do you think cens censorship has uh, has gotten uh, quicker uh, over the course of the year? Um, because you said in the beginning there, there were these uh, pro-Ukrainian voices, and, and then they were censored, uh, and then maybe uh, the attention um, surges again when when there's an escalation. Um, so, do you think that there's there's these voices again, and then they are censored much more quickly uh, than in the beginning? It's a little bit hard to tell. I think a lot of it is also self-censorship. Just you know, people mm -hmm. are aware that they, they shouldn't be posting this, or they should be very careful about posting uh, these types of um, you know comments. And because there's so many 
other controversial issues again taking place within China that one has to kind of be careful about where do they place their sort of bets or where do they, where do they want to express themselves you know, in a more um, kind of open or critical manner. So if you express yourself about Ukraine, you, you're, maybe your account gets deleted or you get no room to express about anything else. So you have to be cautious about where you put your bets in terms of your uh, public expressions. I think that makes it even more difficult for people to choose Ukraine as the issue that they're going to be most you know, concerned with. So it, to me, that maybe self-censorship is a, is a stronger, um, stronger kind of force here. But also, I think just the kind of... Uh, the, the fact that the conflict became so routine, even in the West, right? We don't see media coverage of it on everyday basis. So people are a little bit tired of, uh, of, the, of the war. They're not paying as much attention to it. So I think the same thing is happening in China. People are just not as engaged uh, with what's happening. So that's just kind of the nature of ongoing war that's not gathering or garnering as much attention as in the first month of the invasion. Mm. I think that's very true. Um, another question, do, um, how important do you think, uh, because you said, uh, Public opinion is against uh, military support. How, how important do you think is public opinion uh, for Beijing's policy choices uh, on on the war? Well, I guess that's a bigger question of whether public opinion matters, you know, in general for China's foreign policy decisions. Um, mm. I don't study that direct question, but the work I've read about it suggests that it is at least somewhat important that the party state does pay attention to public sentiment, especially to very strong nationalistic sentiments. So they, they're concerned about appearing as not nationalistic enough or not defending China's image enough or not strong enough. And I think Xi's regime has been a lot more, uh, buying a lot more into this kind of nationalistic uh, sentiment of the public and building up this you know, glory of the Chinese nation, the China dream discourse, the RI, all of it is, 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 is about kind of a more confident uh, China's you know, presence overseas or globally. So I think there is some concern at least, you know, it's indicated also by censorship. If they wouldn't be concerned, they wouldn't delete messages that are more controversial or, or, or more, um, adamant about pushing China into a certain kind of non-compromising direction. So I do think that there's some concern, but to what extent it's a, it's a main factor, that's very hard to tell. I don't think it's the, the only factor, the main factor, but it's definitely consideration. And the other consideration I think is also, it's been written about by some analysts as well, is this notion that um, there's concern about just how Russia is represented in general in Chinese domestic kind of public opinion sphere. And from my research over the years, I found that there are very few critical articles about Russia when it comes to Russian politics. So we don't see coverage of protest movements, like you know, critique, any kind of social movements, because it, it appears that the regime is weakening. And then there could be kind of a interpretation um, made domestically that authoritarian regimes in general are kind of there, they can be poked or weakened or um or even defeated, right? So there's the sense that we shouldn't cover or we shouldn't you know report or give people perspective about any sort of revolutionary movements, even if they're very subtle, uh, within major authoritarian regimes. And Russia, of course, is, is often seen as kind of comparable to China. So I think there is a concern about just how Russia is depicted more broadly. Um, but that's kind of is a bit different from the war itself. But I think there is uh, a lot of consideration and a lot of analysis of public opinion. But um, again, with the war, I don't think it's the main factor, but it does matter. Hmm. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Freeman, um, I'd like to, to ask you two things now. Um, firstly, uh, how do you evaluate the, the military relationship uh, in 2022? Uh, as we heard, uh, joint exercises continue, uh, but China does not supply uh, the Russian military. Um, and does uh, Beijing see, see Moscow's invasion as a net security positive or negative? Um, and how does it relate to uh, Xi Jinping's uh, global security initiative? And the second thing I, I wanted to, to ask you is, uh, do you see uh, China as willing to uh, further alienate uh, the EU and its member states uh, and to incur economic costs uh, by supporting uh, Russia's war? Uh, and what holds it back? Thank you. I'll, I'll try to answer those that uh, fairly complicated question. Um, well, just to start with Putin's own comments uh, in his uh, uh, to Xi Jinping uh, in, a, in their dialogue uh, last month, uh, Russia's ties with with China are the best in history, and and actually uh, attached to that a call to strengthen uh, military cooperation with Beijing, and and she actually responded that uh, China is ready to increase strategic cooperation with Russia, and went on to say, you know, China is ready to work with Russia and all progressive forces around the world that oppose hegemonism and power politics and firmly defend the sovereignty, security, and development interests of country, both countries and international justice. You can, you know, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to make sense of that, you know, defend the sovereignty and support for Russia, deepen strategic cooperation, but that, that uh, but I think uh, Xi's comments align with this new uh, global security initiative and the concepts attached to that that you, you, you referenced. And that includes this concept of indivisible security 
uh, indiv indivisible security was mentioned explicitly by uh, she is one of the core principles of the global security initiative that he announced uh, in uh, at the Bao Al Forum, Bao Al Forum last uh, last spring. Um, of course, indivisible security uh, it's uh, it's a concept that was used during the Cold War. Uh, the idea that that the security of states within regions uh, are inseparable, and that no country should pursue its own security at the uh, interests at the expense of another. So uh, that was a, a concept used to, again to facilitate dialogue during the Cold War. Russia has used that concept. Um, perversely or pervertedly uh, to justify its attack on Ukraine by stating that it was in response to a, to a threat from, from NATO to, to, and violated this principle. Um, of course, the GSI uh, uh, has broader aims. It's, it's, uh, it's a Chinese effort or Xi effort to provide a framework uh, for a security concept uh, that offers an alternative to the US-led security order uh, and, but it's interesting that China's inclusion of that indivisible security concept in its GSI has also been used as part of China's, uh, I guess, campaign on the international stage to legitimize the argument uh, that Russia has made that it was the US and NATO that provoked the war in Ukraine uh, by violating that principle. So uh, she has used the GSI by in justifying uh, the invasion, if not to support it. Uh, and. Um, and yes, of course, China and Russia have continued uh, military interactions. They continued that throughout uh, 2022. Uh, they conducted joint drills uh, in, and Russia's army chief has described the drills as a response to aggressive US military posturing in the, uh, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, in the fall, uh, Moscow actually hosted military exercise in, exercises in the east of its country in, and uh, of the country and uh, and China was the sort of star uh, star attendee uh, but we also saw other countries uh, Belarus India interestingly and Syria were among the countries that took place and and I believe another dozen um, but uh, as uh, I think um, might have been Marson said, uh, while China and Russia have this no limits partnership and a deepening military relationship, it's not an alliance. And China has not come to Russia's aid on the battlefield. Uh, there is no mutual defense commitment. They're aligned. Uh, they're aligned in mutual animosity to the United States and to NATO. Uh, and this they, this is, uh, has enabled them to avoid, uh, in, to, to, to soften the tensions that naturally exist between the two of them uh, and they've been able to cooperate in alliance against the United States or in alignment against the United States uh, through uh, various uh, 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 mechanisms including uh, uh, one that's come up a couple of times the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization and, and China remains uh, a big arms importer of Russia it started to slow down uh, but uh, and it's become less reliant uh, and indeed, Russia had stopped sell, selling China some things because of concerns about Chinese thefts. I suspect that that has changed uh, 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 during the uh, during the war. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, the the main thing in the military relationship is that China's military capabilities have uh, have have are catching up with or even surpassing uh, Russia's and uh, and. Of course, as I mentioned before, as Russia's failures on the battlefield rack up, uh, that is leading Beijing to reevaluate the, it, it, the, the relationship it has with Russia in the military sphere. Uh, it might call Russia uh, at some point a paper tiger. It's a vicious one, but one that really bought into its own hype about its own capabilities. And I think China is skeptical of that. Um, so uh, I think your, to your more, the core of your question, in balance, China assesses Mos Moscow's invasion of, of Ukraine as a net negative, uh, I think, overall, although it's been able to profit in some ways um, uh, it, you know, economically and, and, and in other ways. But uh, it, it's, it's very disruptive to the global economy. Uh, it's putting pressures on, on food security around the world. Uh, and now you even have Henry Kissinger endorsing NATO membership uh, for Ukraine. Uh, which is, uh, you know, a bellwether <laughs> figure. Uh, Kissinger is, is one of those. Uh, and that must be of concern to China as well. Um, and, uh, and also, um, but on, on, the, on the plus side, 
uh, from the military perspective, the Ukraine, uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and NATO's and US response has given China a lot of useful information to, to plug into its, its strategizing uh, on a potential military scenario with respect to Taiwan. Uh, and um, it's also, I think, uh, il illustrated to uh, China the limits uh, and the strains that are inherent in American alliances, uh, especially when your allies uh, are also your economic competitors, as in, is the case of, between the US and, and Europe. Uh, and uh, it's also shown how, how the, that the US has limits on the amount of military equipment it has um, uh, as well, and that there's there are potentials to attrite uh, US military capabilities just from uh, you know, using a lot of equipment. Um, I know we're sending more to Ukraine, but, uh, but our military leaders have been very concerned about, about, uh, about the amount of uh, material we're, we're sending to Ukraine. Um, but China, I think, is in a, been in a really good position uh, with respect to Ukraine overall. It, it has no reason to deepen its role uh, on, on any front, military or economic. Uh, it's, it's had managed to, to find some benefits in the war. And now you have European leaders like the German chancellor going to China, uh, not as a supplicant, I think, but, uh, but uh, to restore uh, really critical economic ties. And, uh, and I think uh, we'll see more, uh, we've already seen more and we'll, there are more leader visits uh, on, the, uh, on the horizon uh, to uh, bolster economic relations uh, between China and European, uh, and European countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think China is, has figured out how to manage this uh, situation. And, uh, and for now, I think uh, even as if the war drags on, it will, uh, it will continue to try to strengthen its economic ties with, with, with Europe in, in select ways, uh, continue to work with Russia, and then also position itself, something we haven't talked about, as a potential channel, uh, mm -hmm. diplomatic channel for uh, uh, negotiations on the crisis, on the, on the conflict. Um, so a bit of a convoluted answer, I, I apologize. Maybe you can clean up me up here with follow-up questions. No, that's great. There was uh, there was a tour de force. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, just just one uh, question. Um, did I did I understand you correctly? Because uh, you said China has found uh, a balance, um, uh, and you seem confident that it will continue to find that balance. Um, but that does that mean that well, it is not ready to um, to incur uh, economic costs uh, due to a. Uh, seriously deteriorating a relationship with the EU. So it would do nothing that would destroy that balance. It is going to try to have it both ways. It is going to try to uh, sustain and deepen its economic connections to Europe, but also maintain this special partnership with Russia. And uh, so hold itself out as, as outside the conflict not having any relationship to the conflict, but counting on the fact that its economic relationship with, with Europe's powerhouses, economic powerhouses are very, very important. And as Europe faces economic headwinds, this gives China, op and China faces them as well, but it, 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 as, as, uh, as uh, uh, Maria mentioned, it, China is facing a lot of turmoil on the economic front at home, uh, but I think, China will uh, be able to find some common ground with Europe on the economic front. And, uh, and, it, and, and it, it may take a while, but I think we will see, uh, we will see other European leaders willing to uh, face um, detractors uh, from uh, political detractors and the political costs in the interest of, of, uh, of finding some economic ballast to uh, stave off economic crises uh, that, that their countries might face. Thank you very much. Um, maybe maybe building on that, um, might I spring a question on, on Dr. Kasmarski uh, here? Um, could you perhaps speak to what Russia's reaction is uh, to not receiving any uh, supplies from China for its military? So here, I think what we observe mostly is silence. Uh, 
I think one one of the one of the reasons might be the fact that Russia does not want to make public any suggestions, any signs, however small, that there's something wrong with the relationship with China. So there is this constant, narrow, optimistic, positive narrative uh, of the, the best relations in, in in the history, which I think we have we have heard since for the last decade at least. Um, Secondly, I guess that any complaints that China is not helping Russia will just increase pressure China is putting on Russia in negotiations. So this would be, I would assume that it, it might be seen as, as problematic as, as, as the showing weakness. And finally, I think that we, we have, that the war has so much narrow down the room for discussion within within Russia and within the Russian expert community mm -hmm. that we see very little genuine debate uh, on potential options and on, on future developments and um, and and um, this this space for discussion has has shrink has shrunk so so drastically Thank you. That's, that's uh, uh, great context. Thank you very much. Um, actually, I had an, another question uh, to you also um, about, um, uh, well, partly about about Europe um, and the impact on Europe. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, how long do you think would it take uh, for Russia to export uh, the amounts of oil and gas to China that it exported to Europe before the full scale invasion? Uh, how much lower uh, will the price be that China will be willing to pay? Uh, and if you if you could comment uh, perhaps again also uh, on uh, the amount of foreign direct investment uh, and high tech components uh, uh, like computer chips uh, that used to flow into Russia from those uh, economies that now sanction it, um, can China replace that? And how long will that take? I think that's that's an excellent set, set of questions. <laughs> so starting with, with resources, I, I, I would say that we, we really need to distinguish between oil and gas, remembering that the Russian budget depends on oil. It does not depend on gas to that extent. And with oil, it's much easier because you, while you still need infrastructure, you need insurance, it's still, it is possible to sell as much oil to China as much China is willing to buy. So in this sense, it is more difficult, it is perhaps more costly, but it is still feasible. Whereas with gas, if once Russia decided not to sell gas to Europe, it cannot sell it to sell it to China. And to, 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 to bring some figures, the power of Siberia, once it's completed in 2024, and an additional pipeline, which both sides agreed, they will be able to transport up to a bit less than um, 50 billion cubic meters annually. Russia has been, uh, before the war, Russia sent around 150 billion cubic meters to Europe, which means that the capacity of the pipelines, which have not as achieved their capacity yet, has to be tripled. Uh, if China would like to send a clear strategic signal to Russia, it, it could do it very easily by agreeing on a trans Mongolian gas, gas pipeline by saying that we are, or by si even better, by signing the contract. We have heard the Russian side uh, saying that there, it's a lot is agreed with Mongolia, but not much has been agreed with China. Instead, during the recent visit by uh, Turkmenistan's president to Beijing, Beijing, it, the Chinese side once again uh, raised the issue of building another fourth branch of the Central Asia uh, China gas pipeline. For me, it, it sends a clear signal that China is firstly bargaining with Russia and hoping for the price to, to, to become even lower. And secondly, it is not willing to send those, those strategic signals. When it comes to the other part of your question about, especially about the high technology components like, like chips, I think that China is in a quite peculiar position here because it's on its own, it's in the midst of the war, tech war with the US where Russia is not able to help and for, because Russia just lacks capacity to help. And uh, I'm not sure if, if China is 
willing and ready to invest in Russia or, or to provide Russia with the merchandise, which, which becomes more and more precious for, for, China, for China itself, unless Russia is going to become a kind of testing ground or I guess we will, an interesting phenomenon to see will be the 5G telecommunications network, where before the war, uh, China's Huawei was present in the Russian market alongside uh, Nokia and um, Ericsson. Once the European companies withdrew, it seems that Huawei is also going to withdraw. And Russia is not willing, on the one hand, Russia is not willing to uh, be dependent completely on China. On the other hand, it does not have other, other options. So I think it's um, China has the upper hand and China is in no hurry to provide Russia with this type of assistance. And it's just uh, seems to be waiting to, to, till the moment when Russia needs to agree to much more than, than, it, would, than it would like to. Thank you very much. Um, and um, yes, I've, um, the statistics I've, I've seen uh, show that uh, China's um, uh, computer chip uh, semiconductor exports uh, to, to Russia have, have actually grown a lot. Um, but I guess the problem is that uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't produce uh, the most advanced uh, chips uh, that Russia might need um, and that it uh, is not able to get from Taiwan or, or South Korea uh, at the moment. Um, so um, do you think um, China is, is uh, uh, already crossing a line with what it, what it is doing uh, uh, on, on computer chips? And do you think uh, uh, it might, uh, might lose access uh, to, to Western um, software or, uh, or equipment uh, as, a, as a response? Uh, or do you think uh, they fly uh, below the radar? I would probably agree with, with, with the latter, but uh, at the same time, my impression is that, that China has been losing this, this access, with especially to the, the most cutting edge uh, technologies. And it's now much less about the US, which seems to be determined to uh, slow down China's uh, technological development. It's rather about US partners such as, such as Japan, Taiwan, and, uh, and in Europe, Holland, or the Netherlands, whether they decide to to follow the US um, in this regard. And I guess this is something which for Beijing is, is, the major, is a major challenge to convince those states that there are other options than just following the US. But to, 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 to conclude, I wouldn't see the Russian, uh, China's potential assistance to Russia as, as, a, as a major case in, in this regard. It's, I think it's much more about the long-term US policy of um, at least slowing down China's technological developments. Thank you very much. Now, um, I would already get to, to um, the last round of brief uh, responses. I'm, I'm sorry uh, for having to ask you for, for brief responses again uh, on a two-fold uh, uh, question. Uh, first, uh, will China escalate its support uh, for Russia in, in 2023? Uh, and very briefly, how? Uh, and second, um, do you have one or two uh, brief policy recommendations for the EU and its member states? Uh, how uh, should they respond uh, to the current trends in, in China-Russia ties? Um, Professor Revnikov? So in terms of the, the question on escalation, uh, my, my prediction, or I guess what I'm seeing uh, from my point of view is that there's going to be more of a continuity from what we, uh, we've been observing for the past nine, 10 months. So continuous support in the informational domain, particularly when it comes to media coverage. But at the same time, you know, I don't, I don't envision escalation in military and economic support directly as, as part of this war effort, but we will continue to see strengthening in economic ties and military exchanges. So not uh, going against sanctions, but nonetheless, all the issues we discussed already, the trade um, and so forth is going to continue to persist and maybe expand in the, in the year um, to come. And when it comes to recommendations, I think it's quite difficult you know, to make them because it's such a complex entity, the European Union, and there's so many different countries that engage with China differently. And I'm thinking of Baltic states here versus Germany, for instance, is having very distinct policies vis-a-vis -vis China. Uh, but just two very small points. One is um, 
from the informational perspective, I think there's at least, you know, in the United States, there's often a tendency to overreact to China's uh, uh, media coverage of, of this war. And I think it's, it already is meant to serve as an instigator to kind of proclaim this, you know, unity, ideological unity with Russia, but also oftentimes it's aimed at domestic audiences. And sometimes this informational domain is mistaken or kind of is treated as uh, the overall support for, you know, Russia uh, in this war. So I think the China's argument, this idea of distinguishing between informational and other domains, security and economic domains, I think it's very important uh, for policymakers. And I'm sure they do that, you know, privately, but publicly we often hear speeches that seem to kind of converge all these arenas together and signal that the informational domain is kind of the key example of how China supports Russia. So I would kind of caution against that. And the second point, it goes back to you know, Dr. Freeman's comment about uh, China potentially emerging as maybe a, a negotiator or as a, as a force in uh, yielding some kind of peace negotiations. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of suspicion towards that uh, idea, but it seems to be something that China has been speaking about more uh, in recent, you know, at least in the past months or weeks. So I, I guess from my perspective, I'll be in support of in some ways, maybe encouraging China to engage in that, in that role, uh, of course, with a lot of caution and uh, trying to avoid potential risks of that uh, engagement, but at the same time, not completely um, withholding China from its possibility. So that would be my one recommendation. I know it's a little complicated to implement, but that's something I'm, I've been thinking about. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Freeman? Yeah, uh, thank you. Again, I think Dr. Repnikova put it very well. I, I, I think uh, there will be a lot of continuity. China will try to continue its, its current approach to Russia, will try to indicate that it has Russia's back. Uh, and uh, within within limits, uh, and at the same time, uh, with the opening, uh, if that's sustained, if China sustains its opening, it will try to improve ties with with other countries uh, around the world, and 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 Europe will be a key target. Uh, at the same time, where we will see a change, I think, is that China will sound out even louder for a negotiated end to the conflict, and. Uh, uh, and and so I think that we can we can hear and maybe that will come with some willingness to work through back channels on uh, on a negotiated settlement. I do think we have to recognize that that it was uh, you know it was uh, the China try, has tried to position itself uh, in in meaningful ways uh, it, you know during the Schultz visit of course uh, making uh, clear that it had uh, conveyed a message. Uh, to Russia that uh, that nuclear weapons need to be off the table uh, absolutely and uh, and so I think it it is it is comfortable within limits of playing that role uh, particularly if it can do that uh, that work behind the scenes while us uh, again calling for uh, a, a negotiated settlement but this will be one that does not uh, does not uh, eviscerate Russia. <laughs> Because it's an important, uh, important partner, uh, and uh, and 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 uh, also uh, China does not see the region as stable without a strong Russia. Uh, it's important to, the the continuity is driven in part. And I'll be really quick uh, because China is not feeling any more secure actually than it was uh, a year ago. Maybe less secure. Uh, she's just had a crisis of confidence in his leadership over the COVID policy, but also there've been um, shifts in the region. I, I just point to the to uh, Japan's new defense policy, which really uh, is, a, is a big um, uh, challenge, uh, security challenge for China in the, in the region. Uh, so as far as a quick advice to Europe, uh, uh, who am I to offer any, any policy recommendations, but, but I think just that Europe has to be, be sure that it recognizes that China's alignment with Russia is as strong as, it, as ever as it approaches uh, it's only uh, trying to secure the resilience of its own economies uh, and also has to be very careful about getting locked into some kind of security dilemma with this very insecure, because I think my view is China is fundamentally, talks a good great game, but is fundamentally insecure. Uh, so Europe can, has to make sure that it reassures China by being very clear about what concerns it has about Chinese activities and policies, and also where it can find common ground. Stop there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kasmalski? I, I will try to combine both questions into, into one answer, because uh, I believe that it, a lot of China's policy uh, will depend, towards Russia, will depend on a broader context uh, on the context of the extent of transatlantic unity, because China is trying to play this game of good Europeans versus bad Americans. Mm -hmm. And the closer, the, the more successful it is in driving this the wedge between uh, China, the US and, and its European allies, uh, 
the more it is plausible to stay away from Russia in those most strategic decisions. In, exactly in order not to provoke the Europeans, not to push Europeans closer to the US. Um, but the, the closer European states and the US, the, the tighter uh, the transatlantic unity, I would see possible, a possibility for China to increase its support to, to, towards Russia. So in this sense, I don't think the European Union can do much about China Russian relationship. It cannot, the last decade or so showed show that it cannot influence Russia and it can do even less to, to influence China. So it's it's rather about uh, reiterating was what, what Caroline and Maria said, that, uh, the European Union needs to be, be cautious and, and approach China with having in mind that, that its partnership with, with Russia is, is really close with all the qualifications that you discussed. Mm, thank you very much. Now, uh, on that note, um, that was a very packed uh, 60 minutes. Uh, I thank you for this uh, uh, tour de raison of, uh, of this relationship uh, in, its, uh, in its different domains. Um, I think uh, this has been uh, exceedingly helpful to, to me and I, I hope also to, to our audience. Um, uh, what remains for me to say is uh, please everybody follow uh, these colleagues' uh, work uh, online um, and uh, make sure to uh, join us again uh, for the next uh, OIP uh, event. Uh, thank you to the speakers, uh, thank you to the audience uh, and goodbye uh, from Vienna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.